I'm going to talk about ethical machine learning. And today is 12th of September 2017, right? We are at the right place, at the right location. So I know that you guys are expecting a lot of mathematical equation. You will not get much in my talk. You will get a lot more in the second talk. For Ilya, you get a lot more in Ray talk. You get a lot more in Mauricio talk. But the most important thing here is all those mathematical sophisticated that you will learn after this, you can apply to this particular important problem. Right? So what I would like to convey is ethical machine learning is an important problem. So first we start with machine learning. If you talk about ethical machine learning, we start with the machine learning first, right? So what is machine learning? So I, I don't need to define machine learning, but I just mentioned that machine learning has had major impact at many parts of computer science and also in the commercial world, right? How do you see the impact? Check Google News, right? The recent Google News, 12th January 2017. This is the year of machine learning revolution, right? 2017 is the revolution. Which month is today? September. You still have September, October, November, December, right? To finish the revolution. What is the second news? 20th January 2017. Four reasons why machine learning is the, is the advertising next big thing. Then another recent news. April 2017. Facebook show off augmented reality. But machine learning is the real star. And then the very important news, right? What is this? 3rd of September 2017. Mr. Putin ordered students to master AI so Russia can rule dot dot dot. What is the dot dot dot? The war. So you'll be feeling up that. Yeah. So now it's after I talk about the machine learning, I just wanted to describe a little bit about our uh, machine learning group at Sussex. So our machine learning group is called Predictive Analytics Lab, it's called Short Path. We just consist of five team members, and hopefully by October 2017, if we are lucky, we will add three more people. We undertake high quality research. As well, if you are lucky, we also managed to publish in the NIPS and ICML, which is a top machine learning conference, and also we applied in the computer vision as well, CUPR, uh, ICCP. So we, if you guys are wondering, uh, where is this University of Sussex? We are in United Kingdom, especially England, and then you know that England is the capital is the London, right? <laughs> and then you know that the University of Sussex is actually just in the Brighton, the seaside area of England. So you can travel from Brighton, University of Sussex, 50 minutes, reach London. That's just advertisement if you would like to come and visit us in Brighton. What else to see in Brighton other than University of Sussex? If you're doing research, you get tired of research, you get depressed, we have this zip wire. You go and climb up 22 meters and then go to zipping for 300 meters. Then you can enjoy this zip wire. Maybe you get more inspiration for your research, right? And we also have 162 meter observation tower. So just, just in case if you like to visit us after this. And this is the talk uh, outline. For the ethical machine learning, I'm just going to concentrate for this particular talk only on the two topics first, which is the fairness and transparency. In the fairness itself, I'm going to mention about many notion of fairness, because fairness is uh, very much under specified. There are so many uh, people that try to define what do we mean by fairness. Because of many notion of fairness, there will be many techniques for ensuring fairness. And then I'm going to conclude the fairness section with uh, my unifying view of those uh, fairness field, just at the start. And then I'm going to cover transparency. And the word transparency, you sometimes hear Transparency, trust, interpretability, explainability, explanation. I'm going to try to differentiate uh, what the meaning by those. So one part of transparency is providing explanation, generating explanation. There are also many techniques for generating explanation. And that comes from the computer science view. But since we're talking about ethical machine learning, you are not only solving it from the computer science viewpoint as well, right? You, all, you also need to see what the other side from the computer science, which is the social science. We can see what explanation is in the social science view, and then also how to evaluate explanation in the social science view. And we can try to reconcile between the computer science and the social science view. 
And as a note as well, this is the first time I'm going to, I'm going, I'm giving presentation on fairness and transparency. So please, if it is not clear, stop me and ask a question. Especially if you don't understand my accent, just stop me anytime uh, you'd like and just ask me to repeat what I'm saying. If by second time you don't still understand, then it's your back luck, right? <laughs> So this is the long-term goal uh, of our group, uh, ethical machine learning, just to mention again, the problem is how to build a learning model that is ethical. So the approach that we are going to take is develop a framework that is able to handle fairness, transparency, confidentiality, privacy, and their combination automatically in a plug and play manner. That's the long-term goal. I'm going to just describe fairness and transparency in this talk. Right? Just as a make sure everyone on the same page, we just mention about machine learning first. If you just see the machine learning box, what do you have as an input? You have, for example, images, right? your holiday photo. And then you have employment application, for example, your input data. And then medical scans as your input data. You put those input data to the machine learning box, to get the output. For example, the output to say which particular object in this particular holiday photo. In this particular employment application, whether to accept or to reject that particular applicant. Medical scan says whether it's brain tumor or not brain tumor. Right? That's the standard machine learning setup. What is the ethical machine learning? The ethical machine learning is when you have the input and you also have a constraint the ethical constraint. For example, the ethical constraint is you cannot use complex, uninterpretable models. Another ethical constraint, for example, is you cannot use protected characteristics. What is this? What is this symbol? Gender. Gender. What is this? Race. Race, right? That's the example of protected characteristics. Do not use confidential information. For example, this is the mental health, and this is the HIV. Right? You still want to produce the same type of output as in the general machine learning box, but you want to incorporate this ethical constraint. And our long-term goal is you want to make, as a plug and play, and able to solve learning problems as varied as the regression, classification, multi-class, until structured prediction, and also to have the automated inference. This project is going to run from October 2017 until 2019, supported by the uh, UK uh, Research Council. So why ethic in machine learning? I promise this will be the last slide about the politics. If you see about the UK House of Commons, the Science and Technology Committee report in February 2016 on the big data dilemma, recommend an urgent formation of the Council of Data Ethics. It has been formed part of the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK largest data institute in London. The US Executive Office of the President in May 2016, that's during the Obama period, urged protection of fundamental value like fairness, confidentiality, and privacy. I don't have anything on the Russian side, but I will ask Dimitri Rettel, maybe we can add that, uh, some statements. Right? So now we're going to talk about fairness. There's another statement as well, sorry. I have one more statement. This is why do we need a fair algorithm? If you are from the EU, how many of you guys from the EU? I live in the EU. You live in the EU? So you are, we will be subjected to this, hopefully. General data protection regulation is going to be law in May 2018. So they're saying that when you process personal data for profiling purposes, you must prevent discriminatory effect. By law, you need to prevent discriminatory effect. Personal data include data revealing racial or ethnic origins. So, right. so that's the... The motivation that why ethical machine learning is an important problem that needs to be solved by as many of us. So the problem setting, for example, this is me. I'm trying to get a bank loan from the Fitbit 24, right? I want to buy this 
Alenka chocolate. Either I don't have money to buy Alenka chocolate or I want to buy a lot of Alenka chocolate, right? So I need to get a bank loan from the Fertiber 34. So what is in the standard machine learning setup? You take the features from this particular person, right? For example, occupation, academic supervisor. Annual salary, you cannot say the rubles because it's recorded, right? The race is red, whatever red is mean. All electoral roll, no. Number of credit card, zero. Number of violent crime, zero at the moment. That's my profile, <laughs> right? And this particular fit 24, for example, put this in the black box. Sorry. Put it in the black box, my profile, which is this, and then it get the low result. And the result is rejected. What do we want is to make sure that this particular box is going to give a decision that is fair. You want to have a decision that is fair. So what is the next slide? What do I mean by fair decision? Right? So what is fair? A decision is fair if there are three groups of fairness definition. I just call it type A, type B, type C. Right? The type A is fair treatment. The decision is fair if it is not based on protected characteristics such as race, gender, marital status, or age. For example, in my problem setting, the decision should not base on the race, whether I'm red race or I'm blue race. Right? And the type B, fair impact. Decision is fair under the fair impact definition if it does not benefit or hurt individuals sharing a certain value of their protected characteristic. We're going to see in detail what, how to instantiate this particular definition in words. The, the third type is fair predictive performance. Given the target outcome, it enforces equal discrepancy between decision and targets outcome across different groups of individuals. So those are the three types of fairness. Let's look into that one by one. Okay? But before that, I'm just going to discuss the learning setup. So the learning setup is we have a set of N training examples. If you have N uh, previous uh, loan applicants, N, for example, 1 million, it will be represented by a feature factor X, which is in D dimensional space. For example, my occupation, the annual salary, the number of credit cards, the number of violent crimes, that is the D. And their label annotation, Y, which is plus one or minus one, to accept or to reject the loan application. Going to uh, focus on the binary classification. But this particular why is actually not to it's not to accept to reject uh, loan application. Sorry, the why is actually whether you'll be able to pay back the loan or not be able to pay back the loan. That's the ground truth, right? That's the why. Whether you can pay the loan back or whether you will not be able to pay the loan back. We have another information which is protected characteristic information that's denoted by the Z where the ZN encode protected characteristic of sample XN. So you will have the ZN for each of the training data points. And what we want is a predictor F for the label Y nu of an N since instant X nu. So this F is actually the one that says to accept or to reject the load application. Right? So the F is the one that is accept or reject the why is whether you'll be able to pay back the loan or not. So the first thing, which is the type A fairness, which is the fair treatment. As a recap, fair treatment is when decisions are not based on protected characteristics. Some known mechanism for ensuring fair treatment, you can simply ignore the protected characteristics. If your data have protected characteristic, which is the race, you can achieve fairness through unawareness by just removing the race information. And you should have. 
but if you can recover it based on the unprotected one. For example? It's a tricky question. Uh, great, I don't know. Maybe you want to protect gender, and maybe there are some you know, physical features which are unprotected from which you can actually recover the gender. Do you want to say, do you want to add anything? Great. I was just going to say location, so some suburbs. Are exactly. Right? For example, if you want to remove the race, but some unprotected features, for example, location, <coughs> where do you live, is actually encode that particular information. Right? Maybe certain race reside in a certain particular location of Moscow. So there are discrimination by proxy. So you cannot just simply remove the protected characteristic. That's why we have the definition of the type B and the type C fairness. So you don't use the protected characteristic for the decision, but you also need to enforce the fair impact and the fair supervised performance. So usually people avoid this discrimination by proxies by not using the race for the decision but use the race information to enforce the fair impact and the fair predicted performance. Everyone following? Everyone thinks that it's very simple so far? So now is the, the second type of fairness, right? Which is the type B fairness, fair impact. What is the definition of fair impact? When certain protected characteristic does not end up positively or negatively affecting a data point. You can instantiate that word, for example, with this particular definition. You have a binary classification model, F. And you have the protected characteristic, Z, as well here, there are several methods that can handle the Z, which is non-binary protected characteristic. For example, the race is not only red and the blue, for example, red, green, blue. But for the sake of presentation for this particular talk, I'm just going to focus on the binary protected characteristic. So there are methods that are able to handle uh, beyond the binary protected characteristic. So one definition is called demographic or statistical parity. A binary decision function, a binary decision models say to be satisfied demographic or statistical parity if the positive prediction, given that you protect the characteristic is red, is the same as the probability of you being predicted positive given the protected characteristic is blue. Let's assume that uh, I've had doesn't depend on Z. The F hat doesn't depend on Z, yes. And just assume that X is the same in both parts? The, the F hat doesn't depend on the Z, and the X is depend on the unprotected characteristic feature. So that you define the X, for example, is the occupation, the salary, the number of credit cards, so it's the same space of the X. Uh, yes, but it might appear that uh, uh, People have different axes depending on the z value. So, for example, if z is zero, then uh, x is different uh, from the cases when z is one. Yeah, but the instantiation is different, but uh, the space is the same, right? My occupation is academic supervisor, but we are talking about occupation. But not everyone is academic supervisor, right? Someone is, is, is professor, someone is, is, is. But it's, it, it's fine, right? This is a standard uh, setup. The x is just your features. Mm -hmm. You just have to make sure that if you make a decision models with the X features, your positive prediction rate, whether in the group of red race or in the group of the blue race, need to match. That's the definition of a statistical parity. No, but if X is the same and the F, uh, if F star uh, F cap depends only on X, then we guarantee that uh, this probability holds. No? How do you guarantee that? Uh, because the, the, the result of f hat given uh, of f hat of x 
It doesn't depend on Z. But the, not, not the, the head doesn't depend on Z. But not the surgery, right? I mean, it's depending on how many Z that you have in the group of the instances. You, you might have many more Z equal to zero. You have much less Z equal to one. It's not I necessary to be. I think if this holds, then you can show that, that F hat of X is statistically independent of Z. I think if this holds, then you have statistical. Yes, so you can you can view that as you have the I have the label I have the diagram later. You have the x and then you have the z and then your f is dependent on the x and the z, right? Okay. And then you want that the x and the z to be independent. Okay. Doesn't seem to look still happy. Just one one more question, please. So, uh, here we consider a case when sine of f hat equals to one because we are worrying about positive input, prediction, yeah. Input, right? So it will be zero uh, if we consider potential input. Yeah. So you say that whether we are only considering why this is not uh, also at the minus one. Yeah. Yeah, because most of the time we are only concentrate on the positive prediction, right? Whether uh, to giving the room. Well, there are different cases. Uh, sometimes agree. you are agree. interested in the okay. opposite. Agree, yes, agree. But then like, yeah. So then you can just define the statistical parity because what you're interested in is the minus one. You can try to match the minus one. But this implies equation for minus one as well. Yes, one minus, sorry, yes. Because it is just a binary uh, classification indeed. If you are talking about the multi-class, then uh, you might have what's different. Any other question? So how to do this? There are many methods, right? So the first one is Richard Zamo in ICML 2013. The easiest way to achieve this particular statistical parity is to define a new feature space, right? Which is the V feature space. The x lies in the d-dimensional space. For example, the v also still lies in the d-dimensional space. But you want to infer this particular v that encode that independence with respect to the protected characteristic z. So what Richard Zemel is, is, is doing is you need to define a, a cluster. For example, you have k cluster. And each of the cluster, each of the k clusters, defined by the latent prototypes. The latent prototypes is this V. If you have K cluster, you have the V1, V2, until VK. Right? And then you have the assignment of each of the data point, X, to which particular cluster. Either cluster 1, cluster 2, cluster 3, cluster K. You define it with the softmax, how many of you guys know about softmax? Everyone, right? Because you are in the deep base summer school before, <laughs> probably, right? So this is the softmax function. So you define it with the softmax whether you are going to be assigned to the first cluster or second cluster or third cluster or the fourth cluster or the k cluster. And you need to ensure that for each of the cluster have the balance between red and the blue rays. Right? So you're going to be assigned to the either the first cluster or second clusters need to be independent with your rays. So you need to enforce that the probability of you being assigned to a particular K cluster when your Z is equal to zero is the same as probability of you being assigned to the k cluster when the z equal to 1. This enforces the statistical parity in the multi-class. But the multi-class here is because the decision is still binary, but it's just assigning to k Latin cluster. Right, so you just enforce it on the its one of the cluster that you have. Since you are trying to infer the V, 
you have this particular statistical parity, but you also need to, for example, if you use the auto encoder models as this research Zamor is doing, you also have a reconstruction error. What is the reconstruction error? You encode from the X to the V, and then you want to encode back from V from the X from the V, right? You have that particular reconstruction error as well. That the V need to be representing of that particular X or encode some information on the X. And they also have the cross entropy loss, which is take into account the label, right? Because this particular uh, statistical parity just enforce the fairness definition. You need to still have the classification and need to have the uh, feature representation loss function as well. So this is in 2013. How to improve this? If you already learned deep Bayesian models, how do you improve this? Uh, well, wait, I have one question. Please. Uh, how can we guarantee you still the, the fairness with respect to binary classification? Because up to now we have clustered data, we have found uh, fair classes. Yeah, yeah. But we still do not yeah. guarantee. And then you, you use the, sorry, I should clarify that. Then you use, you do the classification based on that fair cluster representation. So you mean only uh, based on this encoding? Yeah, mm -hmm. only encoding on the B. So your, your, your classification is based on the B. Thanks for asking. How do you improve this? How to generate another paper on this? We have auto encoder, Ivan. Happy to see you again, by the way. I'm also glad to see you. <laughs> so how do you improve this? You use a variational autoencoder, right? What else? Right? You're going to learn this from the uh, Ilya second talk, right? You can use all the advanced, all the cool technique to enforce important problems, right? Here is variational autoencoder being used to improve on the previous result, right? This is in the iClear 2016. So it is still learning representation V. So this is your X, right? Which is your non protected characteristic features. And then you have the Z, which is the protected characteristic, the Z, uh, the race. And then the V is the new representation that you want to learn. And then in this part, it need to be shaded, need to be shaded here. Actually, for this particular uh, models, your Z will be marginally independent. So the thing here is, they just learn from the X to the V, V back to the X, which is the decoder and the encoder models, just use the deep neural networks. If you know that the variational autoencoder is unsupervised, you can generalize to the semi-supervised model as well. That's the second work on the fair impact. The third one is Zavar et al. in IASTAT 2017. This is slightly different from the previous two methods. The previous two methods try to learn a new letter representation V. This particular method doesn't learn a new letter representation V. Try to enforce the fair impact directly on your prediction model. No more learning V, but try to approximately deliver demographic parity or statistical parity by taking the covariance between the protected characteristic and your decision function, F hat. For example, if your F hat is just a linear model, your X parameterized by the weight factor W. You use this particular decorrelation constraint you can open up the covariance, you will get the expectation minus the expectation A, B, minus expectation A times expectation B. Right? And then you need to see that this is quantity is actually equal to zero. And then you just have the expectation of the centered protected characteristic with the decision. Then you estimate with the 
sample. I mean, and this particular quantity is going to be approximately zero if you satisfy demographic parity or statistical parity, right? The z here, remember again, the z was just zero and one, right? Binary protected characteristic. Going to be centered, it'll be plus minus. And then in here, your f hat is whatever soft output. And then if the f hat, whether you are the positive or the negative, whether you belong to the red race or the blue, if it is going to satisfy statistical parity, this quantity will be approximately zero. That's the third model to achieve fair impact. Uh, but how the correlation is achieved in this particular model? How the correlation is achieved? Yeah. What do you mean by that? You just compute the correlation between the center protected characteristic with your decision function. And then, and then you try to learn the W uh -huh. that has this particular additional term. Okay. So, again, so clarify that. So the, the context is still, you try to learn the W, for example, using a logistic loss or Hill's loss, and then you just add this particular decorrelation constraint to achieve the statistical parity. So and again, where you, uh, we're actually using this uh, cost information Z in order to correct yes. uh, prediction of Yes, of yes. So again, fairness through unawareness is achieved because this particular decision doesn't use the Z, right, the Z. But as Ilya and Gray mentioning, there are unprotected features that encode that particular protected characteristic rates, right? And then you want to ensure there is no discrimination by proxy by enforcing another type of fairness definition. For example, fair impact. So in here, in this model, you have fairness through unawareness plus the fair impact, right? Satisfy the type A and the type B. You should never use the Z in your decision model. Right? That's right. And this is the summary. Type B fairness, fair impact. You need to make sure that the positive prediction, whether you are a red race, and the positive prediction, you are a blue race, need to match. Any issue? I'm not going to continue if you don't answer. <laughs> if you prefer that, then I'm happy you're happy. Huh? You don't know? I might be speaking very slowly, so don't worry. I'm not very obsessed to finish my slides. You can just stop at exactly one and a half hours. Right, so. Any issue? How much does it harm the performance? How much it harm the performance? Excellent. What's your name? Attila. Sorry? Attila. Sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry. Attila. Attila. Okay, Attila, yes. I will try to remember. Then I will ask you another question if I have. Right? In this particular definition, there is no why. There is no the target outcome, right? This F hat was just saying in the context of problem setting to give or not to give the loan. They don't take into account the true level, which is whether you will be able to pay back the loan or not pay back the loan. There is no definition of the supervised performance, predictive performance. Right? There is something missing here. That's why it comes to the type C fans, which is the fair predictive performance. Please. So how does it differ from uh, the previous models? You said that there is a Prediction cost? Mm -hmm. There is no y here. You need to be given z equal to 0, comma, y. Oh, you mean the, the yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right? That's the type C fairness. Fair predictive performance. So it's when every protected group is harmed or helped in the same way. Again, there is so many instantiation of this particular fair predictive performance. For example, this definition of equality of opportunity. This is when you are only interested when you're making the plus one prediction. To give the loan, given the why it's you are able to pay back the loan. 
you need to ensure this. The prediction given the rat race and the, you're able to pay back the loan is equal to the prediction to give the loan given you are a blue race and you are able to pay back the loan. What is this quantity? True positive rate. Right? So y is positive plus 1 and then you're predicting plus 1. So you need to enforce true positive rate to be equal, whether you are in the red race or in the blue race. That's the equality of opportunity. Equalize odds, it's when you try to enforce for the two possible value of the y. Whether the y is plus 1 or the y minus 1, you need to enforce that positive prediction to be the same. So you enforce true positive rate to be equal and the false positive rate to be equal as well. I should be putting this uh, reference here. This is uh, Maurice Hart, uh, Eric Priest, I think, and Nathan Srebo. This is NIPS 2016. So there are uh, independent definition of this as well in the uh, Dub, dub, dub 2017 by the group in Max Planck, but it is, I just use the definition which is uh, defined by the Morris Hart. Right? So you have equality of opportunity or equalized parts. How do we just enforce two positive rate to be equal or both two positive rate and a false positive rate? Right? So this is what I'm saying. So this particular uh, paper in 2016. We try to enforce, I'm just giving an example of equal true positive rate. How do we enforce that? In here, they try to use two different threshold on top of your soft output of the classifiers. Right? For example, your classifier F hat is just the inner product between W and X. And then you just need to predict whether it's positive prediction or negative prediction based on certain threshold. You can put a threshold 0 0.5, for example, usually, or a 0. But in here, the idea is you have a one threshold for the red race and another threshold for the blue race. Right? You have two thresholds. And in this particular paper, especially is act, you, you are using unfair classifiers because there is some uh, notion of uh, if your true prediction, which is like to say whether you'll be able to pay back the loan or not to pay back the loan, if it is inherently correspond or correlated with your race, it's not unfair to use that particular information. So that's why they use the unfair classifier. They use the Z and the X to make your prediction models, you get the soft output, and then you just have the two different threshold for the red race and the blue race. How do you do that? For example, the easiest is for every threshold in the red race, you just try to find the threshold for the blue race when the true positive rate between the red and the blue at the minimum. And then you record that threshold red and threshold blue, blue, and you compute your misclassification. And then you repeat for different thresholds of the red. You also find the minimum on your blue race, the particular threshold that correspond to the particular red threshold that give a certain true positive rate. You need to find the blue threshold that give you almost match true positive rate. Then you record the misclassification. And then you decide which particular threshold of the red and the blue to use based on the smallest misclassification. Right? That's the heart as well. Any question? Won't it appear that uh, actually we're, we're implying some kind of positive discrimination if we're using different thresholds for different traces? Positive. Uh, positive discrimination. Yes, this is this is a very good point actually. 
Because the thing here is, again, as I mentioning, you are actually to define two different thresholds. You need to use the race right. during the decision time, right? So that's why there are uh, people, or this improvement on the next one, which is try to enforce this particular fair predicted performance, but that doesn't use the protected characteristic at the decision time. Because in here, this will be violate the fairness through unawareness. Mm -hmm. right. But this is just one uh, model. Right. So the next one is this uh, Zabar et al. It's the same Zabar that implement the fair impact. This is published in the WWW 2017. The fair impact was in the ASTAT 2017. So the same year, different conferences. And here is they use the same decorrelation constraint between the protected characteristic instead of with your prediction put. Now it's with the definition of the true positive rate. Right? As simple as that. We just enforce the covariance between the centered protected characteristic and the true positive rate definition. And you want this particular quantity to be zero. Right? So again, the way to learn the fair classifiers, you use the same standard regularized models. You have the logistic regression plus regularization, but this paper doesn't have regularization, but just have the logistic loss plus this particular quantity. Any question? No question, right? So now I have question. How many of you guys see this before, Socrative? Only one. Where do you see that? <laughs> so Ivan didn't see that, right? So we are going to use Socrative. Please, please, guys, right? I know that it's a bit boring talk, but let's try to get involved and check whether you understand what I'm talking about, right? Given that my accent is terrible, right? I just have to make sure that you're still following me. So go to this particular website, Socrative.com. You have your laptop in front of you instead of working on your slide or working on your paper or working on your assignment. You go and open <coughs> Socrative.com, right? And enter the room 73957FEC. You go to the student login. Remember, at this time, I'm the teacher, you are the student. Next time, you can be the teacher, I'm the student, right? But this time, please enter this in the student login. Should we check that? How many of you guys already inside that? Are we having internet? Probably not. Oh, we have internet. Can you please show the Yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry. 73957FEC. When I'm going to describe the question, this number will repeat itself as well. So let me just make sure that the internet is still working on it. So I haven't shown you the question yet. And Student login, yes. 73957FEC. I'm not expecting you guys to stare at me, right? You stare at your laptop. Now is the time for you to stare at your laptop and mobile phone, right? It's not when I'm talking and then you're staring at your mobile phone. But now is the time for you to stare at your mobile phone. And we are ready for a quiz, right? 19 of us connected. Is it only 19 of us? Huh? What's happening? You don't have mobile phone? I'm expecting hundreds, right? Hundreds of us, no? <laughs> Everyone connected? 
And please don't choose the option yet, right? Because we don't have the question yet, <laughs> right? I just want to make sure that you are all in, right? Everybody's ready? Control L. Now the question, right? Question is very, very long, so that's why we will take our time, right? This is the example. This is adapted from the dub 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 thousand seventy. Still the getting the loan or not getting the loan. The customer attributes. You have the protected, not protected. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, six previous customer. This is the race, and this is whether you are on the electoral roll or not. One is yes, zero is no. And then this is the salary of the greater than two million pound or two million rubles, right? Two million pound, maybe too much. That's one zero, whether yes or no. That's the ground two. Right? Payback loan or not being able to pay back the loan, right? And this is the classifier's prediction to approve or not to approve your loan application. We have how many classifier? Three, right? One, two, three, C1, C2, C3, right? This is the prediction of one for this particular classifiers, for this particular ground truth, for this particular training examples, right? Good. So now the question, which classifier respect fairness through unawareness? Uh, is it A? Fairness through unawareness, uh, just to clarify, fairness oh. through unawareness yes. is uh, type 1. It's the type A, yes. Type A. Whatever type A means. Is it A, C1 only? Is it B, C2 only? Is it C, C3 only? Is it D, C1 and C2? Is it E, C2 and C3? A, B, C, D, E. You don't have F, I don't know. Right? You need to choose A, B, C or E. How do we know if it respects through awareness? <laughs> oh yeah, you already have this particular classifier decision. Yes. But the definition is about the function, not about the answers. No, 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 it's quite easy, it's quite easy to mm. understand. You don't need to, you don't say, you, you, you key in, right? Everyone have the rights to fold, right? Whether you exercise that rights or not, that depends on you. But hopefully, all of us are voting this, right? It's either A, B, C, D, or E. Oh, isn't it? How many of you guys has exercised the right to vote? None. None of you guys choose? I did. You did? You did? Well, what is the rest of? I chose wrong. <laughs> hey, hey, just one foot. One person, one foot. Democracy. How many of you guys have casted a fourth? Uh, what's happening? You are an expert already in machine learning, right? You attended the deep base summer school. I remember all of you guys, right? <laughs> so how many of you guys have casted a fourth? What's happening with the rest? Who is not raising the hand? <laughs> What's your answer, Ray? I can't figure it out. You, you can't figure out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a terrible, right? Either my accent is terrible or my presentation is terrible, right? If you cannot answer this question. So should we check? Is there anyone who would like to say what is the right answer? A. Why it is A? Because wait, wait, wait. Let me check the majority first, right? <laughs> How is the majority? 42% says A. Is that the majority? By the slim margin, right? Like the Brexit vote yesterday in the parliament, right? By a slim margin past the vote. This is the A, 44%, and there is E as well. Another one, which is 36%. Let's see the question again. So who is saying A and who is saying E? Who is saying E first? Yeah, well, do you would like to share why do you choose E? Because the C1 it prefers the red. The C1 is prefer the red because all the 
Red three customer, they all give the decision. Is it? But is that the definition of fairness through unawareness? Dimitri is already very eager. Ilya is already very eager. So any one of you would like to fight and give the answer? Why this eight? Could be eight. So you need to look at instances differing only at the protected race, I guess. And if the classifier makes different answers on those, it means that it actually looks at the protected. Right? Is that that your summary? Uh, well, I would say that uh, classifiers C2 and C3 uh, provide different answers, although uh, their unprotected characteristics are the same. Excellent! Right? That's why he's teaching the machine learning and the professor, right? So look into this non protected characteristic, right? Those that are the same value, 1, 1, 1, 0. This is 1, 1, 1, 0. The only difference is just the protected characteristic. Those 1, 2 prediction and 1, 2 prediction need to be the same, right? That's the definition of fairness through unawareness. You shouldn't be using your protected characteristic. Is everyone happy with this? Right? So let's continue with the quiz. Ah, I have plenty. <laughs> right? I need to refresh first. Now the second question. Now you're already all an expert in voting. Now we can vote another question, right? What is the next question? Huh? Demographic or statistical parity. This one I don't change. Mm -hmm. So that's easier. You can just remember whatever you already remember. Which classifier respect demographic or statistical parity? Is it A, C1 only? Is it B, C2 only? Is it C, C3? C, C3 only, C1, C2, C2, C3. This is the sequence, the same as well. So which one? You need to choose. Could you remind? So protected feature here is race. But is race. it red or blue? Or what, what are those numbers? One, two, three, and one. Three. This is a person one, person two, person three. Ah, okay. Blue one, blue two, blue so three. it's a binary. Protected feature. Three, indeed, yes. Is there whether it's red or a blue? We cannot say a particular race, right? So it's red and blue, it's very convenient to say without offending anyone. How many of you guys has exercised the right to vote? What's happening? We need participation, right? People at the back, have you casted the vote? Right at the back, that is looking at the monitor. It's not responding. Formulas are easier than numbers. Sorry? Formulas are easier than numbers. Formula is easier than number. Yes. So how many of you guys have casted a phone? What is the right answer? E. E. What is the majority say? What is happening? <laughs> e, right? It's just need refreshing technology, right? It just need to refresh technology. So the E is 70%. Woo! Majority says 70%. Says E, right? So why this E? Why this E? Because for both races it gives uh, an equal amount of yes or no answers regardless of the race. Like for the red uh, race, I think, uh, the second class, the third class, I give an equal amount of rejects and accepts. Uh, so you need to just to see the positive prediction. Yeah. See it like? So this C2 and C3, you have the two positive prediction for the red and the blue. And then in C3, you have the two positive prediction for the red and the blue, right? So that's why the C2 and C3 enforces statistical parity. My last quiz. Before everyone else leaving the classroom. You might get offended if you don't have laptop or mobile phone, right? Then you might leave the room. Yeah, it's not fair. You're discriminating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. My apology. Deepest apology, indeed. Same data, 
Now the question is, which classifier respect equality of opportunity? What is the definition? True positive rate equal. Yes, the hint. All right, in the exam, you have the hint. Equal quality of is, is true positive rate the same. Is it A, C1 only, C2 only, C3 only, C1, C2, C2 and C3? So? You need to fold, right? You, you shouldn't affect the fault of anyone else by saying your choice, right? How many of you guys have casted a fold? Excellent. So what is the right answer? C. C. What does the majority say? Need to refresh again. Sorry. Oh, better and better, right? Learning. Learning, indeed. So now is the majority, 91% say C, right? It is the right answer. Why it is the right answer? You just need to compute your true positive rate, right? All of you guys know how to compute true positive rate, right? You just need to compare or take into account this particular ground truth, right? As you see now, is the equality of opportunity is the only criteria from the three groups of fairness definition that take into account the ground truth, right? Everybody is learning, very good. So we saw that there's a lot of definition of fairness, right? There's type A, type B, type C. So the problem here is which fairness criterion or criteria to use. I'm just going to mention about this, not going to describe in detail because you already bought. This is uh, going to be published in the NIPS 2017. Uh, with my colleague from University of Sussex as well. We recycle two well-established machinery techniques, which is privileged learning and distribution matching to satisfy multifaceted fairness definition. So we all, we group all those fairness impact, fairness supervised performance. We just define one criteria that can be instantiated for different Fairness criteria, statistical parity, equality of opportunity, equalized odds. And then we also use the privileged learning to enforce fairness through unawareness. How many of you guys know about privileged learning? No? What you need to read about the privileged learning is this. Fafnik and Fasis, right? Neural Network 2009. Ah, privileged. Privileged information, yes, looping. So this is, uh, I'm not going to describe in, in detail, but I just wanted to flash some uh, ideas that we have. And if you are in NIPS this year, you are welcome to uh, criticize our pa paper at the poster, right? So not in front of the camera, <laughs> to do it offline, right? So privileged learning, just to give a, a flavor of the privileged learning. You have the training information, which is the X and the Y, but in the previous learning, you have the additional feature, which is X1 star for each of the training samples. And this particular X star is only available at training time. And you want to use this X star to build a better decision or classification models. But you don't want to use that X star at the deployment time because it's expensive to acquire, for example. If you define, for example, X is just a feature from the 2D image. Maybe the X star is just a feature from 3D camera and lesser scanners. Maybe it is expensive to gather this particular 3D camera or lesser scanners at the deployment time. And in the previous learning, you want to make use of these extra features to have an accelerated learning. Accelerated in the sense that instead of requiring uh, 1 over n, you require 1 over square root of n. Right? So you require much less training data. 
to achieve a particular convergence. And what do you see here with the privilege and the definition of the fairness problem setting? This is the fairness problem setting that we saw in the very, very beginning. What do you see there? In here you have the Z protected characteristic information, right? That is not supposed to be used at the decision time. And the privileged learning frameworks actually says that you have the extra features that you can use at training time, but you cannot use it at the deployment time. Uh, right? Wait, but doesn't it depend on, on a particular formulation of uh, fairness learning? Yeah, you mentioned yeah, 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 you're using different yeah, thresholds, yeah, 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 you're yeah, actually yeah. using it. Yes, using yes, yes, yes. So in here is you can use privileged learning to achieve fairness through unawareness plus the accelerated learning, right? You get two things in one store with the privilege learning. And then the, the next thing is you just wait. I can go to here actually faster. Why is this not connected properly? So the link was not working properly. So this is the privilege learning to achieve fairness through unawareness. And then as Dimitri says, you still have this those definition of the equalize or equality of opportunity statistical parity. So we need to use other things, right? This is just a privileged learning uh, algorithm. I'm not going to describe this in detail, but this as we are using a specific SPM Delta Plus. Again, Dimitri says in the beginning that it's all connected in a probabilistic sense, but probabilistic, non probabilistic, they are the same, right? They are trying to do a prediction, one thing or another, you are free to choose, right? But I, we just use SPM Delta Plus by this based on the JMR uh, 2015. We have the probabilistic models of the previous learning, but we don't use that. That's not a big deal. So here is just, if you see the optimization problems of the SPM Delta Plus, the blue one is the standard SPM. The SPM Delta Plus, it just use the privilege features to modify the required distance to the decision boundary. Instead of one, you modify that according how hard or how easy is that particular instance and in the privilege space. And that's SPM data plus for the privilege term. And then the privilege itself is not enough. Right? We can still suffer discrimination by proxy because those unprotected characteristics can still leak into your decision. That's why you need the distribution matching. So in here, the distribution matchings, we just need to define the two distribution. You want to match distribution, you just to define the two distribution, right? That's a simple thing. <laughs> the two distribution is the distribution on the group of the red race, and the other distribution is the group on the blue race. What kind of distribution you want to enforce? Usually distribution matching, you enforce the distribution on the X. But that's no one stopping you to enforce the distribution on the function or two, F hat. Right? The F hat on the red race and the F hat on the blue race. How, how, what are you going to achieve with this? You're going to achieve statistical parity. Right? And false positive prediction to be the same between the blue and the red. For the equalized odd, you just need to define the true distribution of the true positive. You can also enforce the false positive. Right? So now what you need to do is you just need to add this distribution matching mm -hmm. to the objective of your privilege learning. And then you end up with the one messy optimization problems. You can either go to Anton, for example, to ask how to solve the optimization problems, or you just try any optimization problems on the shelf, right? This is just a visualization of the two distribution. This is the Z equal to zero, and this is the Z equal to one. This is SPM in this particular row. This is a method that enforces the distribution matching. For example, here, as you can see, 
at the z equal to zero, this is uh, uh, a misclassification. Sorry, this is y, y times f hat, right? If you get it right, you get a positive. This is negative. So you try to compute the misclassification. In here, you can see that this particular z equal to zero, you actually doing a, a lot more misclassification than that particular. Sorry, this is less misclassification comparing to the red face, right? This is without enforcing the distribution matching on the misclassification. You can try to enforce distribution matching, then you get the almost similar misclassification between red race and the blue race. Then we just, just as, as a side, instead of uh, trying to infer this distribution and form the parametric definition of that particular defini uh, distribution, we use the maximum mean discrepancy. I know you covered this in the deep base summer school, right? How many of you guys have heard MMD? Uh, we covered first Western distance. This is uh, somewhat pretty similar to MMD. So, sorry, you covered? Uh, Wasserstein distance between the two distributions. I don't know. Is it the same, Ilya? I'll talk about it. You'll talk about it, yes? He's going to talk about it. Right? So all those fancy stuff that people are going to talk about it, you can use it to solve the important problems, which is ethical machine learning, right? So this is the MMD, just try to enforce the distance between the two distribution to be small because you want to minimize the distance here without inferring the form of those two distribution from the samples. You just care about the sample itself and try to match the mean. Reference is GMR Trusted 12. Then we show that some uh, existing methods is a special case of our uh, distribution matching uh, definition. And then we also talk about the Pareto Frontier. How many of you guys know Pareto Frontier? And Ilya is going to talk about it as well. Right? So you're going to... Huh? Not about Pareto Frontier. But you can talk about it as well, right? So that's, and this is a Pareto Frontier because you try to balance between the accuracy or the misclassification and the fairness criteria. Right? Those are not in the same line. So instead of just receiving or instead of just returning one models, you can return several models, right? That balance that fairness and the accuracy. That's the optimization procedure that you can use, for example, or Anton will clarify that or will correct that or add some other option to solve that, right? So then the next one, I'm going to be briefly talk about transparency. How many of you guys would like to listen about transparency? And the rest, you are free to go. Right? You, you have an extra break, half an hour. So, no worry, I'm not offended to if you're leaving before my end of the talk. So I get used to it. So we're going to talk about transparency. Right? So first, we are going to differentiate between transparency, trust, interpretability, explainability, and explanation. Right? This particular field is also quite a lot of definition. A lot of people try to work on this particular uh, field, and each one of them comes with different definition. Either we have transparent model, we have interpretable model, or we have a trusting models, or whatever thing, right? So here is, I take the definition from the social science. This is an archive paper in 2017 by, I think, Tim Miller, from either Monas or Melbourne, so Australia, right? Far away, but they also come here. The same as Ray, right? So the transparency and trust. We want to design and implement machine learning systems that are transparent to better equip to understand and therefore trust the machine learning system. If it is transparent, you can increase the trust. You can achieve transparency and trust by those two complementary approaches. So which is one is interpretability or explainability. So generating decision in which one of the criteria taken into account is how well a human could understand the decision in a given context. So this is talking about the interpretable models, right? Interpretability. The second orthogonal way or complementary way to achieve transparency 
is to make your box to explain the decision to the people, giving explanation. Those are the difference between explainability, interpretability, and explanation, right? But some, some, sometimes it is a bit blurry as well. So I'm not going to get to the quiz because you're already so tired with the quiz. So let me just ask you a question. Which one of this particular model is high interpretability? Is it A, linear model? Is it B, decision tree model? Is it C, deep neural network models? Is it D, rule list model? Or is it E, none of the above? We say A. I would say it depends on many factors. For example, on. on we say B. <laughs> we say C. We say D. We say E. Okay, everyone has an opinion, right? So, what is the right answer? What, what do you want to say, Dimitri? Sorry, I cut, off, cut you off. I want to say that it depends on the. Uh, uh, no. Additional circumstances. For example, the, uh, the item B depends on the depth of the tree. If the tree is shallow, yeah, then it's interpretable. Yeah, excellent. The same applies to D. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, it did. So this is like linear models, not necessarily to be high interpretability. Linear models, if you have one billion features, then it's not very interpretable. Right? The same as decision tree, the same as the rule is model. I don't know what to say about deep neural network because I don't know them. But all of you guys know about them, right? So it is defined. You need to enforce a small number of features or a small depth in the decision tree. So this is, we go back into the GDPR again, write for an explanation. I know it's about EU, we are not caring about them. Oh, it's a corner. <laughs> but anyway, so this GDPR is right for an explanation. You would like the user to have the right to ask for an explanation of an automated algorithm that was made about them. This is somehow people use it as a motivation to look into a transparent machine learning, interpretable machine learning and generating explanation. Because by law, it's going to be a law in 2018 and you cannot use machine learning algorithm anymore if you cannot explain the decision. Right? That's why people scale. But there's a caveat. There is a people in the Alan Turing Institute, which is a legal scholars, not a machine learning scientists, they're the legal scholars. They look into this GDPR, it's actually they say that the GDPR is actually not right for an explanation, it's just right to be informed. There is the difference between explaining the decision and explaining the system functionality. And the GDPR was just en enforcing system functionality explanation. So from that particular paper, which is, which is this, most of us don't need to be scared yet. Unless the GDPR is going to clarify more and more about what they want, what the right for an explanation. So now I'm going to explain between the difference between system functionality explanation and decision explanation. Right? So here is the still the same problem. Is this me trying to get a loan from the Fitbit 24? It's rejected. I said, please explain. The Fitbit 24 the system functionality explanation, we can just say that we use this guy. You can explain what is this guy. Okay. That's system explanation. Decision explanation is you are rejected and not accepted because your race is red. In the training set, almost all people having accepted loan have their race as blue. That's the decision explanation. Okay. And this is actually very crucial. People in the computer science, they don't provide explanation in the contrast way. In the social science, they have research for 20 years. People accept explanation when it is in the contrastive mode. Right? You don't have to explain all the causal attribution of why I'm rejected, whether my race is this, whether my salary is something, whether my occupation is something, no. You just wanted to know the contrast, how to get to be accepted, right? This particular system said that it's just the race is the problem, right? And in here from the decision explanation, you can see that this is an unfair system, right? With the explanation on the decision side, you know about that. So how to provide explanation 
this is from the computer science view that I already mentioned before. There are many words that try to explain this particular decision. So this is actually from ICML tutorial in 2017. How many of you guys attended that? You attended the tutorial or you attended the ICML 2017? There's a big difference. Tutorial, I see. So, right? So if you have a question about this particular tutorial or interpretable machine learning models, ask Dimitri. Okay. There were so many quizzes during this tutorial. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. I see. So just like yours, but much more. Much more, I see. So we need to have much, many more quizzes, right? So this is... Uh, I still have 10 minutes. Maybe I can try to explain this. You want to get explanation about this? No. no? Go on. Oh, go on. I see. I thought you say no. <laughs> so this is one method to provide explanation. I'm just going to give an example of how the computer scientist is giving the explanation. Right. This is the blue and the red is a complex decision boundary. Predicting the positive and the negative. And then this, this is an explanation about the decision. So you are being decided to be plus. And then you want to know why you are decided to be this particular plus. And the way they approach this is you need to have a interpretable models to provide the explanation. And the interpretable model here is they use uh, linear models. And not only linear models, they use uh, interpretable features. So in here, the complex decision boundary, you can use any complex features. Word to fact, if you are doing a document classification. Inception network, if you are doing image classification. Whatever complex feature set you can think of. But the interpretability need to come from the linear models with the interpretable features. For example, in the word, uh, in the documents, it's just the binary features of the particular word appearing or not. In the image, it's just the superpixel regions of the image. So if you have that interpretable models, you can try to provide explanation using that interpretable models, right? That's different between interpretable and explanation. And the way they try to approach it is from this particular task that you want to explain, you need to find the, that the point that is nearby. Because you just want to explain this task. And this particular looking at the data point that is nearby and increase the weight that is very near to the task that you want to explain, it's where the locality comes from. Right? The model is called local interpretable model agnostic. The local is this because you're looking at the local area from your task. Model agnostic because you can explain any underlying complex models. So you try to build the linear models with the interpretable features that minimize the weighted least square. Right? This is the F, which is the output from the complex models. This is the G, which is what you wanted to infer. Just the linear models with the interpretable features. And then they enforce this particular interpretability by also saying that the complexity of the G is you need to be just K non-zero features. Right? That's the line models. So here, the example here, what you can have is Explaining the prediction of atheism versus Christian, then you can try to see which particular interpretable features is having a high weights. Right? Because again, here, the weights is on the words. You can see that it decides atheism because of this particular feature, posting, host, HTTP, etc. And then from this particular explanation, you can decide or you can think that maybe this particular classifiers it's not taking into account the right things to differentiate between atheism and Christian, although they achieve very high classification performance, right? And that's the image. You try to divide into the super pixels. And then the explanation is you decide that this is a tree frog because of that particular region. Right? 
And then this is uh, another way uh, to provide explanation. So before, this is explaining in terms of the important features. You can also explain in terms of which training data point is the most crucial to decide your particular prediction, right? So this is the paper by Koch et al. in ICMR 2017, which is the best paper award in the ICMR 2017, right? Working on the important problem, which is the transparency of machine learning, right? So this is they use the influence function to identify which starting point most responsible for your given prediction. Here again, it just concerned about explaining a particular decision test. Why do you decide this particular level for this test? What you can do is you can compare the loss when you infer the parameters using that particular training data point and compare the loss when you infer the parameter when you remove a particular training data point. So you can infer the influence of that particular x, y training data point on this x test, y test. Leave one out. Right? You compare the loss. For a given test, you repeat it for 1 million training data point that you have, right? It's going to be very costly. So what they have is this influence function that is approximate this difference between the loss. And then you can just check the influence, the high influence, it can be high helpful, that's the positive, or it can be high and harmful, that's the negative. So you can just take the side of it. Right? And that paper, you just try to make this particular quantity uh, to be computed in the scalable manner. And this is the result, for example, for this particular test image, this is the trend at the point that is important according to the SVM, and this is that is important according to the inception features. And what they were emphasizing is that this particular test for this SVM is just looking into the pixel space, right? Because background is very similar. Well, if your projector is good or my slide is good, then you can see that they are very similar in the background. But this particular feature, inception features, the background is a bit different from the test. But it still thinks that this is the helpful one. And then they also found the dog is also helpful. And this task is just differentiating between the fish and the dog. Right? All of you guys that attended ICML, pretty sure that you listen about this particular talk, right? So you can ask to those people that attended ICML. This is just a different way. And this is just another example of the explanation that people produce from the computer science viewpoint. It's not very clear, right? This is a green jay because this is a yellow bird with a blue hat and a black throat. That's good enough from computer science viewpoint. That kind of definition. But it's not enough from the social science viewpoint. So when we talk about the ethical viewpoints, it's not about us, right, computer scientists. We're not exclusive. There's other sciences, right? So that's the social science. We need to look into what they're doing as well. And that's the contribution of this Tim Miller. Very, very nice. He read 200 social science papers. And then he summarized in this particular archive. All of you guys that are interested to do ethical machine learning should read this particular archive. Right? That's from the social science viewpoint. And he said that if you don't finish reading my archive papers, because it's very long, this is the summary that you need to take into account. Explanations are contrastive. People do not ask why even P happened, but rather why even P instead of even Q. Explanation, contrastive. Explanations are selected. People rarely, if ever, expect an explanation that consists of an actual complete cause of an event. You don't want to know all the causal attribution. Why this is a particular bird that is, this is called green jay because it's a blue hat, a black throat, and yellow bird. By the way, this is a very nice word, but maybe you can supplement in terms of the social science viewpoint, in terms of the contrast. Then you don't need to mention all those explanations, right? You just highlight that it is not this, it is this instead of the other class because of that particular. Right? Explanations are selected. Explanations are social. It's a transfer of knowledge from the people that are trying to explain and people that is being explained. Right? The explainer needs to take into account the knowledge of the people that try to be explained. Right? 
apology. I didn't take into account your knowledge. That's why maybe my talk is a bit off. But this is when you try to explain, you need to have uh, this social interaction, right? You need to know what you know, and then the explainer need to adjust the explanation. So explanation are social. So the explanation are not just the presentation of causes. They need to be contrast, interact, and select a subset. That's the summary. And as well, another important point is the likelihood of the explanation is not the important thing, or it's not the only thing. You also need to talk about the simplicity, generality, and coherence. That's when you try to evaluate explanation. You need to take into account that your explanation is simple, general, can explain more general case, why even P, not Q. You can have different Q. I need to be coherent. So co coherence means? Coherence means that it's for the same cases, your explanation is the same for different P and then not Q. For the same P, is the same. Right? So this is like, they also mentioned about counterfactuals. P, not Q, but they clarify that the counterfactual is not from the causal inference called counterfactual. That's why they call it FOIL, the Q. They just try to avoid the confusion. But this is very nice archive paper if you want to read. And then that's it. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to get any other question. I'm done. You're free to go. Let us first uh, thank the speaker.